Um, today we're going to be talking about election, God's sovereign choice, and we're going to be looking at Romans 9, 10 through 13. And so we're going to start with reading the word. So if you'd stand and follow along, and I have it up here, hopefully, if you don't have that with you. And not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had nothing and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. This is the word of the Lord. Let's commit this time to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you today. We pray that you would open our eyes to the wonderful truths in your word. May we glean truths about you today from your word that will impact our lives this week and in the following weeks. We thank you that you are a sovereign God, and we rejoice for the salvation you bring to your sons and daughters through election. What a merciful and gracious God we serve. We commit this time to you. May your spirit move and convict, we pray. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Election is God's sovereign choice. A couple quotes on election. One of my favorite pastors and persons to read is Spurgeon. And he said, Whatever may be said about the doctrine of election, it is written in the words of God, as, in, as with an iron pen. And there is no getting rid of it. There it stands. And he said, there is no more humbling doctrine in Scripture than that of election. None more promoting of gratitude, and consequently none more sanctifying. Believers should not be afraid of it, but adoringly rejoice in it. And that's hopefully what we are going to do today. Uh, this is a tough topic to cover sometimes. Um, we struggle to understand what God did, why he did it, and those types of things. And those quotes kind of talk about it. But hopefully, by the end of the night, we can look and, and rejoice in what God has done. We're going to look at a couple terms before we get involved in this discussion. Uh, because election is one of those terms that is connected with a lot of other terms. So we need to know what some of these mean. Foreordination is the broadest term, and it deals with God's will with respect to all matters that occur, whether that be the fate of an individual person or the falling of the rock. God foreordains. The next one is predestination, and this refers to God's choice of individuals for eternal life or eternal death. And then the one that we're going to be talking about today is election. And that's the selection of some for eternal life or the positive side of predestination. And so we want to keep these things in mind and kind of know exactly what we're talking about when we look at election. We're looking at specifically those that are chosen for salvation. As we looked previously at Romans 1 through 9, we found in those scriptures that not all of those that descended from Abraham were truly Israel. Paul talks about that. Um, and in the first example, he gave us Isaac and Ishmael. Okay? We know the story. Ishmael was born first because Sarah was barren. Isaac came after and was Sarah's son. Both came from Abraham, and yet God specifically chose Isaac to be his chosen son, the one that was going to build the nation of Israel. And Ishmael, of course, went another direction. From Romans 9, 8, not all children of the flesh who are of God, but the children of the promise. 
And so that's what we're talking about tonight, is we're looking at, it's not about flesh, it's not about will, but it's about those that God has chosen to be children of the promise. And this is a great example of election, but for Paul it wasn't good enough. He has to take it to the next level. And so that's what he does with what we're going to look at today. Romans 9, 10 through 13. Uh, Paul has a specific structure for argument. He's very studied, and he knows how to be able to present his argument in a way that's really going to resonate with the people. And that goes to speak to Paul's training. Paul was trained under rabbis, and he knew how to communicate the truth specifically to the Jewish people. So his structure for the argument that we're going to look at today is he's going to start with a fact. And then from there, that fact, he's going to back that up with a statement from God. And then from there, he's going to develop his doctrine. So he's going to use a fact, he's going to back that up with a statement from God, and then he's going to develop his doctrine. Now, that's the way we're going to present it, and if you look at that passage, it's not the way he does it in the passage. In the passage, he gives a fact. In between the statement and the fact, he develops doctrine. But for the case of tonight, I'm going to make it this way, fact, statement from God, and then we're going to develop that doctrine. <clears throat> so the first thing we're going to start with is Rebecca and Sarah. What was interesting in this study is I've always focused so much on election that I've that I glanced over this, but so this was kind of cool in study, that Rebecca and Sarah are in the same boat, or were in the same boat. Now how was that? Well, they were both barren. Remember, Sarah could not have children for a long, long time, and when they finally did, it was so ridiculous that they both had a good laugh over it. Okay? Rebecca is in the same boat. And so I think this also, Paul ties into election. God had to intervene miraculously for both births and nations to happen. Now, how does that relate to election? God has to choose us. He has to draw us and enlighten us to our sinful state before we can come to him for salvation. John 6, 44. No one comes to the Father unless the Father draws him to me, and that specifically fits in here with election. So, Kind of a cool pre-story before we get into it about Rebecca and Sarah and being barren and God having to step in and do something miraculous. And so here's our fact. Jacob and Esau prove that being a direct descendant does not mean that you're elect. Okay? And we're going to find out that it takes it a step further than the Isaac and Ishmael argument. So here's what Jacob and Esau had. First off, they had the same mom. Remember, in the other case, Isaac and Ishmael had different moms, Hagar and Sarah. Now, in this case, they had the same dad, which was the case in Isaac and Ishmael. But what makes this more of an argument, they came from the same womb, and they were in there at the same time. And that's significant. Same womb, same time. And of course, the story we see in Genesis 25, 22 through 23, the children struggled together within her, and she said, if, if it is this, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So this is where Paul is getting this information from in the Old Testament. A couple things to connect with the idea of the struggle. Okay? The struggle between Jacob and Esau started in the womb. And that is telling of what is going to be the case later and later on. Jacob, we know, becomes Israel. Esau becomes Edom. And these two did not like each other at all. As, as brothers, they struggled. And as nations, they really struggled. And then, of course, we're going to come back to this idea of one being stronger and the older who would then serve the younger. So we're going to look at God's sovereign plan. 
culturally, Esau, being born first, would have been blessed with the lion's share of everything. Okay? So if you look at the culture back at the time, the oldest son got the best of everything, right? or the biggest share. Okay? So the best and the most culturally. Culturally, Jacob, like many of our game shows, would receive nice parting gifts on the way out the door. Okay? He'd get scraps. He'd kind of get the leftovers. However, this is not God's plan. And this is where it's kind of cool. Okay? Uh, Jacob, the youngest, would become the nation of Israel. Esau, the oldest, would not be chosen and, like I said, become the nation of Edom. God does not always function according to culture and according to our society. Just because those are human norms for us to say, firstborn gets this, second, and the rest get a little bit less, doesn't mean that's the way God functions. Okay, so we're just going to review real quick the fact that Paul's going to base this on. Jacob and Esau proved that being a direct descendant of Abraham does not mean that you're elect. Okay? And so now we're going to move on to the statement. Oh, before, let's look at this. Interesting that later John the Baptist would say, don't tell me that you're Abraham's descendants. He said, God is able to raise up these stones and make them children of Abraham. And Jesus talked often to the Pharisees about being nice and pretty on the outside and the dead on the inside. And we know that some of that was, you know the law, you're, you're a big person, you're connected to Abraham, but that doesn't mean a whole lot to me if it's not real and on the inside. And so we see that being connected to Abraham doesn't necessarily mean that you're elect. Statement of God, we're going to look at two of them. The first one what is the statement, the older will serve the younger. And, and again, going back to the passage, God told this to Rebecca while they were still babies in her womb. So she knew this was going to be the case. And this goes back to his explanation of the boys being leaders of different nations that would struggle. And this made sense to Rebecca. I'm sure part of why Rebecca went to the Lord in prayer was that she was freaking out that there was so much stuff going on. What's going to happen? Is something bad going to happen? And God was able to explain, no, this is normal. This is what is going to come in the future because you have two nations there. Statement of God number two, Jacob, I have loved, Esau, I have hated. And this is a more difficult one, so we're going to spend more time on this. The shocker is most people connect this passage to Genesis. This is not a passage. Genesis. Does anyone know where it's from? Bible trivia. Malachi. One, two, or three. Hate is what causes people to get hung up on this passage. Okay? I didn't think God hated anyone. What about God's love? What about love wins? What about this? What about that? Well, let's look at the culture. ESPN, did you know? Hate does not actually mean hate here. And I'll explain that here. Here's another instance in, in Scripture where hate is used. In Luke 14, 26, Jesus said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus was not telling the crowd to hate, actually hate, their father and mother and wife, because obviously that would go against other teachings. What he means by this, it's a relative attitude. Okay, Hate, um, in this setting, means to love or favor less. So what Jesus is saying is, your relationship to me should be so much bigger than anything else that it looks like you hate your family because you're spending all your time with me. And that's exactly what his disciples did, right? They left the nets, they left their families, they left their jobs, and they followed Jesus. And that's where he was using it there. So in Malachi, hate 
8 we're using as the same kind of description there. He's saying, I favor, I love Jacob much more than I do Esau, because that's a part of my plan. So God's purpose and plan before time involved God choosing Jacob over Esau. God's favor being placed on Israel over Edom. And we're going to review the facts in the statements real quick. In fact, Jacob and Esau prove that being a direct descendant does not mean that you're elect. In the statement of God's to back that up, the older will serve the younger, which went against culture. And Jacob, I have loved. Esau, I have hated. And again, hated means to love less. So here's the doctrine that we're going to look at, and this is going to be the bulk of where we spend our time. God carries out his plan through election. Romans 9, 11, we'll spend some time here. Well, they were not yet born, had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. So what we pick up from this, one of the points is that this is not a random choice or a whim. We're going to develop this point. This is not just doing this. Okay? We're going to see how it fits in. Ultimately, it fit with God's plan and his purpose that he did before the beginning of time. This is where some of those other terms are going to come in. But it fits his ultimate plan and his ultimate purpose. How God's election takes place. We're going to look at a couple terms, break 11 down. Though they had not been born yet, in verse 11, God made this choice before birth. In fact, he made it before time. Great passage here. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. He chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us, for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. We were chosen before the foundations of the world. How election takes place before they had done anything good or bad. What's the significance of the statement? Future actions are not a part of the election process. Okay, that's what it tells us. Um, God did not look down through time to see which of the brothers would be better. It says specifically, before they had done anything good or bad, it precludes that option. Why is that important? If it was based on actions, what would we all get? Right? If it was based on what we do, what would we all get? I talk a lot about what we deserve in my Bible class. We all deserve death. We all deserve hell. If it's based on action, we're all going to be there. Okay? But doesn't God have the ability to see the future? Why wouldn't he use that to see people's choices and behaviors and pick them? This is kind of on the Arminian side of the argument is that, you know, what about our choice? What about our actions and what we do? So we have to, we have to do that to God. End of verse 11 kind of, I think, blows this up. It's not because of works, but because of him who calls. It's not based on what we do. That's just the way God chooses to do it. This is his call and this is his plan. Also adding to this is verse 16 of Romans 9. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on, God's, on God who has mercy. So again, it's not our actions, it's not what we do, but it's based on God who has mercy. What Esau wanted and his actions to achieve it didn't matter. Think over the story. How did this all play out? God chose Jacob 
before the beginning of time. How did it develop? Well, we've got the part where Esau goes out hunting, right? Jacob making the nice stew, wafting it Esau's way. He comes home hungry, sells the birthright for a bowl of stew, right? The second part of this, Rebecca helps him out tricking Isaac, right? Putting the hairy things on his arm because Esau was hairy. Walk in and trick blind dad to giving you the other part of the blessing. Esau's actions didn't matter. It's what God planned and orchestrated to happen. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, another great verse. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. If it was because of something I did, and it's not necessarily God. And so this way, it's all about God. And that's who we need to boast in as we look at election. It's not because of our works, but because of him who calls. This verse, like I said, takes away the Arminian view that God can look through time and choose based on actions. Okay? Again, I go back to the original argument. If we, we were all sinners, and there's nothing really great about any of us to be chosen and to look through time to see who's better than, than the other person is just not the way Paul seems to be basing the argument. Election is not based on what people have done, are doing, or will do, but on God's merciful plan that he put into place before the beginning of time. And I reference Ephesians 1, 4 through 5 again. Before the foundations of the world were laid, he called. If it was action or worst base, <clears throat> if it was, if you look at the story, wouldn't Esau have been a better choice? Right? Jacob was a deceiver. He was a trickster. He was a deceiver. Do you know that that's part of his name? The whole thing of when he came out of the womb clutching Esau's heel had a big part to do with his name, part of which means deceiver. And that's very telling of what he's going to do. And again, when you read it with the idea of election in mind, it's amazing how God orchestrated these things that happened just as he had planned before the beginning of time. Election is not based on birth, nationality, good or bad works. Election, election is based on God's plan and God's mercy. So why election? This process must happen, according to verse 11, in order that God's pur purpose in election might continue. And continue here in the Greek means to last or endure. So this is God's plan to make sure, election is God's plan to make sure that his word, his promises, and his plans are going to endure because he's accomplishing it through election. He's accomplishing it through election. This is an amazing, amazing truth that Paul is bringing to life. And again, you know, it is difficult to grasp. There are some things that we have to deal with, okay? Because this goes against what we do. How do we choose? How do we make decisions? We make our decisions based on actions or benefits. I do this because I'm going to get this, or I'm going to choose this person because I know I'm going to get this, this, and this. But here's something to keep in mind. Isaiah 55, 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So Isaiah is saying, does it really have to be our way? Does it have to make sense to us perfectly for it to actually happen? Well, Isaiah said God's ways are higher. We don't want to put God in a box because of our thoughts on justice. Think about Job. Job did a great job at the beginning. Right? And actually, when God responds to him out of the whirlwind, he doesn't actually say Job sinned. The issue that God had with Job is 
you're saying either you're if you're right and you're true, then I'm wrong. What Job didn't take into consideration was that he could be right and God could still be right and Job would still suffer because that was a part of God's plan. So we can't put God in a box just because of our thoughts and how we think and how we rationalize the whole thing. God is God and his ways are higher than our ways. How can we understand the mind of God? These are some of the questions God goes through with Job, right? Were you there when I laid the foundations of the world, right? And do we, do I ever want to answer to God like Job did as God spoke to him out of a whirlwind in 38 through 41 and asked him two and a half chapters of questions? Where were you when I did this? Our minds are sinful and they're marred with our sin nature. And again, I go back to the fact that nobody deserves to be chosen, but we need to be thankful that he is merciful. And there is going to be stuff that we have to do because we are elect and chosen. So we're going to draw a few conclusions here. We've got the election of Israel, but elections of nations through individuals. God chooses Jacob, not Esau. We cannot remove the individual from the process. A lot of people like to argue that 9 through 11 in Romans is not talking about God choosing people unto salvation, but it's choosing the nation of Israel. And I argue, how does he choose the nation of Israel? It's through individuals. And so the same principles that God uses to choose the nation of Israel, it would make sense that he chooses that individuals unto salvation. So God chooses people for salvation. The context of this pa the passage also speaks of individuals unto salvation. If we skip down or back to Romans 8, 29 through 30, it's very clear that Paul's talking here about individual salvation. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What an awesome verse that talks about the beginning of the process to the end of the process and how it's in God's hands. He's going to do it. He's going to predestine. He's going to call. He's going to justify. And he's going to glorify. So, this has been a thunderbolt of a discussion over the last little bit. Rob Bell, in his book, Love Wins, read it, um, thought there were good points in it, thought he missed the mark a little bit. Uh, the idea of universalism is a false and dangerous doctrine. We can see that from what Paul generates in Romans, in Romans 9. If Ishmael wasn't chosen, and he was the son of Abraham, what does that mean for all of us? Okay? It's true for Israel. It's true for the individual. Okay? So we're not all guaranteed that. So what's the correct view of election? Well, for one, it's not arbitrary. Like I said, it's not, you know, all of the people ever in the world in a room and got, you know, with the lottery balls and calling out numbers, right? Romans 9, 22. What did God desire to show his wrath and to make, his, make known his power as endured with much patience the vessels of his wrath prepared for destruction? In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for his glory. So we're going to use this passage and what we already know to make some connections here. Do you see what that illustration is saying? Beforehand. The elect were created by God before time. Before time they were created. They were elect and were created specifically for God. 
God is not selecting from the fallen race. We are a production of a new humanity in Jesus Christ. And so I want to hit that again because it, it took me a while to get this as I was reading through it. Okay? We are fallen. But when we were created, we were created for a purpose. We were created to be this production of new humanity that Jesus was going to redeem after the fall. But we were created to be elect. And I go, I go back with our statements here with Spurgeon. Whatever may be said about the doctrine of election is written in the word of God as with an iron pen. And there is no getting rid of it. There it stands. There is no more humbling doctrine. You see how it's humbling. There is no more humbling doctrine in Scripture than that of election. None more promoting of gratitude. And consequently, none more sanctifying. Believers should not be afraid of it, but should adoringly rejoice in it. Uh, as we conclude tonight, I would like all of you to just bow your heads and close your eyes. If this election that, that we're talking about is not you today, if you know you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, today is your day. God is sovereign, and just like Esther was placed in a Persian court to save her people, God has brought you here tonight to be saved. He called you before the beginning of time and orchestrated all of the events of your life to bring you here at this moment for such a time as this. What an amazing and awesome God. If God has drawn you to himself today and you feel that he has opened your eyes to your sinfulness and your need for a Savior, would you raise your hand? If you are elect today, but you have not been living like Paul urges in a way worthy of the great calling that he has brought us to. Isn't it time to get back to a worthy life? Are you seeking out others with this great news of God's mercy and grace? God has called us to go and preach the gospel. Are we doing it? Are we making disciples? Are we coming into the study of his word and the church just in a mode to receive. This is not the worthy way to live that Paul's called us to. If you want to recommit today to telling people the good news, making the disciples, exercising what you know so that you are living a life worthy of the call, would you raise your hand? Thank you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we worship you today. Thank you for those of us that you have elected and chosen. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for your mercy. We know that it is absolutely nothing to do with us. We deserve immediate death and hell, but you have given us mercy and grace through your Son. May we go from here today and not sit back and relax because we have our ticket into heaven. God, may we seek the lost. They might be chosen, but we don't know who those people are. May we seek them. May we bring them in. May we, may we disciple them to Christ. May we serve you and your church. Help us live lives worthy of the calling you have placed in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.